Hi, thank you all for coming. We're just thrilled. Yes, yeah, so I'm Nancy Leland. Uh, I make those wonderful little cyanoscope kits that you guys presumably all have, and if you don't, I would totally encourage you to get one. Uh, I am also um, spend a lot of time working in the lab with Jim. Um, he's been very nice about letting me back in and having um, access. Huh? I locked you in there. You can't. Oh, I know. It's scary. He's like, I'm out of here. You're here till midnight, right? Like, no. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a project um, that we we did last summer um, and it was uh, sort of an idea that we had that we wanted to look at what was going on with bioaccumulation um, food webs and potentially trophic cascades across a seasonal spectrum so we we're looking at um, for the whole summer and this happened to be on Lower Mill Pond so it very nicely overlapped with what Haley was doing with her aerosols so um, it made for a lot of efficiency, right, with what we were doing and, and the types of questions that we could get at in terms of our data set that we had. So it was really, it was a great project. So um, what I have done is I've created what I call TMAX research. Um, and the reason why I did that was I wanted to embody within the concept of TMAX of what we are all about in the lab, at least what I think we're all about in the lab. Um, we're trying to answer the questions um, that we have for research, but the, the questions that we have and the things that we want to understand are completely driven by the end user. And in this particular case, it would be someone like Karen, who is a Board of Health agent, uh, someone like Brian Horsley, who works for a local nonprofit organization and what the communities are asking for, what are their issues, what do they want to know about, um, and then we come in with looking at what do we need to do to improve our methods um, to make it easier to provide them with this information and the technology so that they can go out and multiply and spread around and spread the good news, but also come back with the data that they need to make their own decisions locally so that they can take their actions. Um, and we're there more as a support structure behind them. So that's our, our working philosophy. So uh, we have these meetings every year, of course, to talk about what are their issues? What do they want to know about? And so they presented to us this whole idea about the um, juvenile alewives. Um, they have over 30 sites on the Cape that have active runs, uh, alewife runs, where the herring are coming in and doing their spawning and then uh, the juveniles are then out migrating at the end of the summer. Um, so they wanted to know what was happening with the interaction of these alewives that they, they love, everybody loves uh, working on the alewife projects, and the uh, cyanobacteria and the cyanotoxins that they produce. Um, so that's where we started out with in terms of looking at the bioaccumulation, but we also knew that we had to include someone else in this conversation, and that was, of course, the zooplankton. So we are looking at the um, entire food web and how the toxins might be moving through that particular um, food web system. So we wanted to keep this really simple and that is one of the underlying philosophies of everything that we're doing with our all of our monitoring protocols is to make it really simple so that we can get it out there to the locals so that they can um, do the collection, get the sampling, but also do what we consider to be a very robust interpretation of what's happening with um, the cyanobacterial populations and risk associated with that um, is sort of our biggest thing. So we started with our um, cyanobacteria, the cyanoscope kit. Um, we were working obviously in conjunction with APCC folks. So they had already been trained. Um, so we had a sort of like a baseline monitoring protocol that they use as part of their rapid assessment protocol. So they all know how to do it. Um, and so what we did is we, brought in a whole new layer to answer the questions regarding food webs um, and, and uh, cyanotoxin transfer. And what we did for any of you who have worked with your pocket zappers that are in the kit, you know that there's basically two samples that are being generated. Um, when you're processing that sample, you're getting the cyanobacteria, the BFCs off of the top of the device. But then there's also this the whole world of the zooplankton are migrating down to the bottom. So there's this 
sample that we always knew that we wanted to use and we had it in our vision um, of working with the, the zooplankton, but we hadn't put it into the field yet with the locals and having them using that data from that sample um, to help them understand what's going on with bioaccumulation. So that was a new, a new sample that we were using. Um, we also were using our less than 50 micron ring net to get our less than 50 cold lake water sample. Um, which is very important because the less than 50 sample is the edible fraction. So this is the toxins, where the toxins are going to come from that are potentially transferring up through the food web. <clears throat> so we kept that very simple. What we wanted to look at was the cascade. Um, so you see here on, the, um, on this uh, y-axis over here, we're looking at our grazer biomass. So this is taking that zooplankton sample and basically just measuring it and estimating what the amount of biomass is of, of the grazers that are in the system. So that's what these red dots are. And then we also looked at our, we used our fluorometry and we were looking at the relative contribution of the, of the edible fraction to the whole lake water sample. So our less than 50 to whole lake water per site. And these are the bars that you see um, so what we were able to observe is at the beginning of the season in May, um, we had uh, basically a lot of biomass, a lot of zooplankton biomass in the system. Um, by June 7th, okay, so this was a week later, we went back and it was almost all gone. Almost all the grazers were gone. Um, there were some rotifers there, but not a lot. And so that remained consistent throughout the summer that we did not see the grazers respond in terms of being able to come back um, into, the, into our samples. At the same time, we had an increase in the relative contribution of the less than 50 fraction to the whole lake water. So for almost all of the summer, Lower Mill Pond was just a big cauldron of edible fraction that was less than 50 microns in size. Um, the reason why this was of great interest to me, and I'm thinking maybe Kaylee, um, with her aerosol work, is some of the work that was done by Kate Langley demonstrated that this less than 50 to whole lake water um, fraction is a good indicator of potential for aerosolization. So when we looked at um, what we had for our less than the uh, values for our phycocyanin throughout the summer, what we did see was an increase in our less than 50 um, concentration in the biomass of the less than 50. And basically what we had was a bloom condition. So we confirmed that we had not only a trophic cascade happening in terms of impacting the zooplankton population, but we also had an increase in the less than 50 fraction, which is what you would have expected for a trophic cascade. So we did accomplish that. One of the questions we had was, what are these guys eating? Um, because obviously the food source is gone out of the system. Um, unless, of course, they were feeding on rotifers, which we didn't count. They were eating cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and the way we did that, we developed some new methods. Brian is in the back of the room. Uh, we came up with what we call our uh, anal flushing gut rinse, and we rinsed out. <laughs> that was like Jim's idea. Blame it on him. <laughs> but. I got to tell you, there is so much information in this gut rinse. It was amazing. Really quickly, we did fluorometry on it. We also did toxin analysis. What we saw in terms of the um, relative concentration of this gut rinse to the whole lake water sample, the gut rinse was 33 times higher uh, than our whole lake water for PC, 230 times higher for PE, which is more associated with the Sinatrococcus and the, and the Picos. Um, it also is 125 times higher than our MC. And I did do the MAA, but I'm not sharing the results because I'm questioning them, but it was in the thousands. So um, yeah, so we're gonna do that again. Very ambitious time. Okay, we're expanding. Next. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I'm gonna be this summer. Um, APCC wants to get involved in this project, so they are hoping to go Cape wide to um, all of most of their sites of their herring runs across um, the Cape. So uh, that's what we'll be doing this summer. And certainly, if you any of you want to follow along, I'll be doing postings on research great 
research aid and cyanos.org. I want to be able to listen to it. Thank you very much.